Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, school's out, restrictions are in as Omicron hits Canada's hospitals. Omicron spreads like wildfire. If we do not act, the results could be catastrophic. The major moves to protect the healthcare system. What I don't have now is nurses to redeploy. Almost everybody is getting COVID. And who's left out in the cold? Both parents working from home trying to manage two young kids. I don't think the parents are willing to do double duty anymore. Plus, from airlines to the blue line, COVID disruptions wreak havoc in workplaces of all kinds. This is a pile of messes put together into one big mega mess. And she survived residential school only to be taken by a nun to live in another country. They took me. They took me without permission. Now the government wants her to prove it. You know what? My story matters. We go along for one woman's extraordinary journey. Oh, Debbie. This is The National. Tonight, to deal with this pandemic's newest twist, the ultra-fast-spreading Omicron variant, more provinces are going back to their old ways, reintroducing strict public health measures not seen in months. Ontario announced major changes today, and one look at the situation in hospitals explains why. Ontario's reported hospitalized cases are ballooning. They're more than double today what they were just a week ago. ICU cases are also heading up. We face a tsunami of new cases in the days and weeks ahead. So the math isn't on our side. We could be thousands of beds short in the coming weeks. Faced with that, the decision was made. At 12.01 a.m. Wednesday, the province will bring back a list of restrictions, hoping to at least slow the virus that can't be stopped. We'll get into all those restrictions in a moment, all the new disruptions millions of Canadians are about to experience. But we want to start with the reason, the worry and fear building in hospitals as Omicron moves in. Christine Birak brings us that picture. If healthcare workers thought things couldn't get any worse, it appears they were wrong. Confirmed Omicron cases are climbing to staggering new heights, and with limited testing, the actual numbers are even higher. If we don't do everything possible to get this variant under control, the results could be catastrophic. Ontario's premier noted if just 1% of people infected with Omicron need care, that's hundreds, if not thousands of new patients daily. The province's latest modelling predicts between COVID-19 related hospitalizations and other patients, Ontario's on track to overwhelm its hospital capacity within days. We've started to see an alarming number of new hospital admissions. Now with triple digit admissions into hospitals every single day. Pausing surgeries will open up more beds, but hospitals say it's not that simple. It does feel catastrophic, and I'll tell you why. At Humber River Hospital in Toronto, patient beds aren't the problem just yet, but staffing them is. What I don't have now is nurses to redeploy because almost everybody is getting COVID. And what that does is it significantly wipes out the workforce. And ER doctors warn new restrictions won't slow the surge in patients who got infected over the holidays. It's very frustrating that now when things are really just out of control, that all of a sudden they're they're making the decision. Add to that, patients are getting younger. This Montreal hospital reopened its pediatric COVID ward and is now seeing admissions on a daily basis. In previous waves, babies were essentially un unaffected by COVID, but now I'm seeing newborns. So in that first 30 days of life with, you know, significant disease. Still, healthcare workers are trying to remain optimistic. The disease caused by this variant does appear to be milder, which means hospital stays could be shorter. And ICU admissions have been lower in other countries battling Omicron. The hope is this wave will pass quickly, but for hospitals, it'll be the hardest one yet. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. As Christine mentioned, Ontario has now joined other jurisdictions in pausing non-urgent surgeries and procedures to try to save hospital capacity. These decisions um, are not taken lightly uh, and there is consequence to them and we're very aware of that. It's estimated that could affect eight to 10,000 surgeries a week, adding to a backlog from the last pause. 
Quebec City made a similar move on the weekend, New Brunswick last week. Now, if postponing surgeries feels a lot like the early days of this pandemic, so will this. Today, Ontario announced it is moving schools back to virtual learning. A lot of families struggled with that the last time. But as Julia Wong explains, it's not the only school decision creating worry tonight. Schools are essential! Schools are essential! Parents' frustrations brought to the steps of Ontario's legislature Monday as the Premier announced students will go back to remote learning until at least January 17th. A return for many families to some of the hardest parts of the pandemic. Both parents working from home trying to manage two young kids. I think both situations fail. I don't think the parents are willing to do double duty anymore. He's so excited about school um, and having, having it been online, it's just so different. They're just not there. It's so easy for them to tune out, just not pay attention. Ontario Premier Doug Ford defended the move as necessary. The hospitalizations, the schools, uh, the economy, the businesses, that's who we have to protect. And we've never seen anything like this. Almost every province and territory has now delayed the return to the classroom as case counts everywhere climb. Most to January 10th, others like Ontario to the 17th or beyond. But not Saskatchewan. Students there return as scheduled this week, and feelings are mixed. She's excited to see her friends and teacher and stuff like that. I mean, a little anxious as a parent, but they have to get back to school. They got to, you know, get back in the routine. Kyle Anderson has five children, all of them double vaccinated, and scheduled to go back to school Tuesday. They are concerned because they understand that it's not just about them, it's really about our whole community that's being put at risk. Widespread transmission and outbreaks in Saskatchewan schools will be inevitable, says one infectious disease physician. It's just going to get progressively worse and worse and worse, and it will be very difficult to safely keep schools open. Complicating yet another school year in the pandemic. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. And it's not just schools where COVID anxiety is hitting. More Canadians will soon be living under new restrictions. Closures and capacity limits are coming into effect in several places. As Jacqueline Hansen explains, for businesses already struggling to survive and the people they employ, things are about to get a lot tougher. The annual rush to stick to New Year's resolutions has hit a significant snag in Ontario. Gyms are preparing to close their doors again. I sort of just kind of threw my arms up in the air like this is our fourth time being closed. This Toronto gym owner had hoped the province would have explored other options first, like more masking or further capacity limits. That's a simple, easy way for all of us to stay open. Indoor dining is also off the table. Outdoors is allowed, but in January, that's hardly an option. For this server, it's a major loss. Living without a job is terrible. Also forced to close indoor concert venues, theaters, museums and other attractions. Elsewhere, including retail stores and malls, capacity will be capped at 50%. Ontario says it will expand support for businesses. Workers affected can apply for $300 a week through the federal government's lockdown benefit. $300 a week is better than nothing, but it's not, it's, it's not enough. Um, I don't want to get $300 a week for doing nothing. New restrictions were announced in Newfoundland and Labrador as well, including capping restaurant capacity at 50%. This owner says the jump in cases has already kept most people away. Whether you know, we're allowed to open or not, the, the fact of the matter is there's nobody out. While the restrictions mean he can now apply for federal rent and wage subsidies, he says relying on government support isn't what he wants either. Do I want to be in this position? No. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to operate a, a business same as anyone else. Not every province is bringing in new restrictions. In Nova Scotia, officials said they would wait and watch. Right now, we can't justify a stricter lockdown, but nor can we justify throwing the doors wide open. Back in Toronto, the gym owner wants government officials to make a resolution this year. We're very reactive right now. We need to be proactive. So that businesses like his know what it will take to one day get back to 100%. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now let's bring in Dr. Zane Chagla, who's an infectious diseases specialist at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. Dr. Chagla, can I ask you this? I've been curious about this. Who is getting sick? 
to the point where they require hospitalization? And I ask that in terms of their vaccination status. Yeah, so there's really kind of two groups. One is critical care, where it is overrepresented by people that are unvaccinated, undervaccinated, and people that, you know, have immune problems where a vaccine may not take and their underlying conditions make them higher risk. But we are seeing a second phenomenon. You know, these aren't people in the ICU. They're on the ward. Some of them may have mild pneumonia. Some of them, you know, are, are fully vaccinated but are just frail and elderly where they become dehydrated, they become ill enough to really make it to hospital mm. uh, with a mild illness and, and they require care. And so, you know, the, both of those groups are the ones causing hospital strain and hospital cases. Right, and, and, and here's why I asked the question, because I, I get the feeling that there's a sense of resignation among more and more people that, you know, everyone will get sick eventually. What do they need to understand about this problem that should concern them, whether they're vaccinated or not, whether or not they think they will be one of those people in a hospital bed? Yeah, you know, the likelihood is that most people will do well, especially if they've had their vaccine series. And, and you know, I, I reassure people that that's true. But, you know, you, they're still able to transmit and, and getting to these very vulnerable people uh, whether they be unvaccinated, poorly vaccinated, or people that are frail and elderly, you know, is much more of a possibility now than it ever has been through the pandemic. That leads to healthcare strain. We have healthcare workers that need to be in isolation. And the combination of all of that means that, you know, routine care in hospitals, surgeries, and, and the things that we come to hospital for on a day-to-day -day basis get compromised over the next couple of months. Okay. And Dr. Chagler, we have more questions for you a little bit later in the program, so don't go too far. Thank you so much. No problem. The Canadian Armed Forces is getting ready to help Quebec's vaccination effort. The number that uh, Quebec has, has asked for and that the Canadian Armed Forces have approved is approximately 300 uh, people who will be trained and then eventually deployed. Those 300 will help organize clinics and ensure that they have vaccines and other supplies. They'll be deployed Thursday in Montreal and other parts of the province as needed. And another call for military help tonight, this one from Bearskin Lake First Nation, 600 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, already under a state of emergency with over 170 cases among its 400 residents. The community has few nurses and no space to isolate the ill. In a statement, the chief says, we have requested financial and other supports from the federal government, but we have been told that the assistance we will get is minimal. A spokesperson for Indigenous Services Canada said, Additional personnel, including three primary care nurses and a paramedic, have been deployed to the community. Well, delays and disruptions continue to plague the travel industry. Today, there were dozens of cancellations at Calgary's airport. Um, they told me that that cancellation was due to lack of personnel, due to COVID cases. We were delayed for two hours because they, uh, I don't know, they didn't say whether they don't have any uh, uh, personnel to... Um, to uh, put in our luggages in the plane. WestJet has said a combination of weather and the pandemic staffing crunch has forced it to cut 15% of its scheduled flights this month. And in the United States, that same combination is also wreaking havoc on travel and several other industries today. Katie Simpson shows us the double disruption to the lives of millions of Americans. Rarely does the U.S. Capitol get a winter storm this intense. Some 25 centimeters of snow closed schools, the federal government, and businesses. And everything is shut down here. <laughs> yeah. We even tried to get some shopping on and nothing's open. Even Air Force One had a rough go of it. The truck transporting stairs to the plane's door got stuck and needed a good shove to be free, delaying the start of the President's Day in Washington. The storm swept across much of the East Coast, causing added misery for air travelers who are already dealing with thousands of delays and cancellations because of COVID-related staffing shortages. This is a pile of messes put together into one big mega mess. We've never seen anything like this. This is not just one airline. This is not just one city. Uh, uh, this is not even just one country. Lineups for COVID testing are long, as the U.S. is now averaging more than 400,000 reported cases a day, a surge that's hit airlines and frontline workers especially hard. We already know that there are reports from fire departments, from uh, police departments in different cities that they're 10, 20, 25, and sometimes 
30% of the people are ill. We're not in a good place. I'm going to be really honest with you. This is the winter surge we predicted. With no end of this wave of illness in sight, this winter weather landed with an added thud. Given that the, the storm is going to be uh, continuing later in the day, we've had to cancel um, that COVID testing for today. It's another blow at an already brutal time, the start of a new year that so far feels so much like the last one. And we've got Katie joining us from Washington. So, Katie, any idea when these staffing shortages may begin to ease? The weather-related backlogs are going to pile onto the COVID-related backlogs. It's going to take the airline industry weeks to sort that out. As for frontline workers, especially in health care, that problem will get worse. The National Guard is being called in to help in some hospitals. Expect to see more of that as this wave of illness gets larger. Andrew. Katie Simpson, thank you. As kids across the U.S. return to school this week after winter break, authorities are expanding access to Pfizer's booster shots. Everyone between 12 and 15 years old could soon be eligible. The FDA also authorized a third dose for those 5 to 11 who are immunocompromised. Here in Canada, boosters are not yet approved for anyone under 18. Now, the sports world has also felt an impact as Omicron races through teams and forces fans to stay home. Here's Jamie Strachan on the rough ride facing the remainder of the NHL season. Oilers on the move, Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid and the Oilers on Broadway as Edmonton faced the New York Rangers. Taken away by Strom. The only game on the NHL schedule. Ottawa was supposed to host Minnesota, but with nine players sidelined by COVID, the game was postponed. That news just hours after the Toronto Maple Leafs revealed an assistant coach tested positive. And so did superstar Austin Matthews. We both tested positive on their rapid here this morning, and we'll, we'll just await the results from their PCR. The listing off of infected players and postponed games is now a daily ritual. It's just a lot of moving parts, obviously, and it's challenging times for everyone, so everyone's trying to do their best. Game was Borgen, it gives it away, Park calls it, scores! Omicron has rattled the NHL. Currently, every player and staff is tested every day. Those who have had COVID get a 90-day reprieve. Still, the fast-spreading virus has caused more than 90 games to be postponed. They not only play together, but they socialize together and they travel together. So it's a very compact group, probably with a lot of interactions. Lead pass, here's Birch. Other professional leagues like the NBA have lost games to COVID, but none have paused playing like the NHL did over an extended Christmas break. I think they will do anything they can to play 82 games. Some Canadian games have been put on ice because provincial COVID restrictions mean fans have to stay home. Toronto plays a home game in front of no fans, and they played one on Saturday. That's $3.5 million of revenue gone. Montreal played one home game without fans in December. That's $2.3 million of revenue gone. Some teams can't afford those losses and are hoping to reschedule when restrictions lift. The league insists all postponed games will be played, but NHL watchers say that could be challenging. Come the third week in January, whether you can have full arenas or not, you're going to have to play. For now, nothing is predictable. Every game uncertain until the puck drops. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, as COVID cases soar and Canadians confront new restrictions, time tonight for a checkup with the doctors. You need to isolate. It's so important. A negative test really doesn't mean a ton these days. From the best symptoms to watch for now to what to do if you test positive. Next, a new set of questions for a new phase of the pandemic. Plus, why the British Prime Minister could be in trouble with his own supporters. I think he speaks awesome rubbish. And one woman's search for proof that she was taken from a residential school and abandoned in another country. This proves everything. This little piece of paper. How a journey into a painful past led to a joyful reunion. You didn't change much. Oh, Debbie. We're back in two. Welcome back. Well, Omicron has certainly changed the game, hasn't it? As cases skyrocket, our thinking about how to tackle the disease, both in terms of policy and our personal lives, has had to adjust, leaving some big questions about what we thought we knew. 
So joining us right now to sort through some of those questions, Dr. Danielle Martin and Dr. Zane Chagla here for another round of questions. Uh, hey, Dr. Martin, maybe I'll start with you with some practical information about how to deal with COVID or suspected COVID illness. I mean, given how contagious Omicron is, how do you approach someone, for example, in your household who's sick? What would you do? Right. So the first thing is, uh, in a perfect world, of course, we would all be able to get a test at the first sign of a symptom. But we're not in that world right now. It's, it can be very difficult for people to access testing. If you have any symptom that you think might be COVID-19 or anyone in your household has a symptom that you think might be COVID-19, you need to isolate. So anyone who you've uh, been together with in close contact without a mask, uh, in the last few days, you need to let them know because they would also be considered a close contact for you. And you mentioned symptoms a few times now. Can you remind us what do the symptoms actually look like now? Because there has been something of a, an evolution there, right? That's right. It's been changing partly because the, the virus keeps changing and also because most of us have now had uh, vaccines. And so uh, it does tend to be a, a more mild presentation. Uh, so still a sore throat, cough, shortness of breath, uh, loss of, tense, of t uh, sense of taste or smell are all uh, continue to be common symptoms. And of course, um, some people may still experience the more classic symptoms we think of with COVID-19, such as high fever, uh, muscle pains all over their body, and just that general low energy that you feel when you've really been uh, knocked down by a viral illness. Dr. Chagla, you know, with the strain on, on PCR testing, rapid tests might be the only di diagnostic tool that families have, but how should we be interpreting those results? Yeah, I mean, look, a positive test in, in the reality of what's going on today is a positive test, and you should interpret it as a positive test. Don't go for PCR, call yourself positive, take a picture, you know, document it, um, but, you know, treat it as a positive. A negative test really doesn't mean a ton these days, and, and for a couple of reasons. One, you know, there is some studies suggesting the sensitivity of these tests with Omicron has gone down. But secondly, you know, we, I've certainly seen people where uh, the disease, you know, really, really turns on quickly, where people have very minimal symptoms or no symptoms, and the next day they're fulminantly symptomatic with a negative test that turns to a positive test. Uh, and so, you know, it is a small snapshot in time if it's negative. It's still not, it's still hard to rule out COVID even in that context if you're using it for kind of a social gathering or that type of thing. Um, but, you know, it, it certainly is a, a reasonable test to trust when it's positive, especially in someone that's having symptoms. Have you, have you heard of uh, folks improvising, Dr. Chagla, with these rapid tests? I mean, I, you know, using it to swab your throat and then your, your nasal passages presumably that might lead to a more accurate result. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's a lot going on in social media. There's, there's case reports that are going on. There may be a bit more of this upper respiratory tract uh, 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 reservoir for it, and, and so you might have higher levels in the throat. You really do want to follow the instructions on the kits, though, and then that's an important thing, right? Not all kits are meant to do saliva. It may inactivate the test. Uh, and so you really, really want to make sure that that's within the guidelines of your kit. Otherwise, you may get a negative result uh, when you're, you know, aiming to get a positive result and, and make it, uh, uh, you know, make it uh, uh, behavioral changes mm. based on that. Uh, Dr. Martin, how far have we come on the treatment front? Well, things are accelerating really quickly, and that's another reason why it would be good to slow this wave if we can. Uh, so that we can get uh, infrastructure in place to treat especially those more frail people who are more likely to have severe illness. So um, processes are being set up across the country for monoclonal antibody uh, therapy for those who would need it or would qualify for it. Um, in primary care, which is where most of us will get treated with COVID-19 uh, if and when we get it, uh, there are lots of uh, treatments available. So certainly anyone who's got a cough or any respiratory symptom will benefit from a puffer. There's actually an antidepressant medication that can be prescribed by your primary care provider that's been shown in combination with that puffer to uh, help people with mild COVID in the community. So if you feel really pretty well and you have mild symptoms, you just need to take good care of yourself and try to not pass the virus to anybody else. If you're feeling a little sicker, or if you have any chronic diseases that mean that you're a little bit more worried about the effect of, of this on your health, 
you should reach out to your family doctor or primary care provider because there are prescriptions that can help to manage that more uh, mild illness in the community. And then, of course, for people who get more significantly sick, uh, there are more pills coming and uh, IV therapies coming uh, that we need a little bit more time to get organized for people. Coping in the age of Omicron. Uh, Dr. Martin, Dr. Chagla, thank you so much for your time. Helpful as always. Thanks, Andy. No problem. And next, the burden of proof on a residential school survivor. They took me. They took me without permission. She was taken by a nun, abandoned in the U.S., but her search for evidence takes a twist. I just can't believe it. You're there. Her remarkable journey, right after the break. Welcome back. As Canada continues to attempt to right the wrongs against Indigenous people, in many cases, it is still up to the individual to prove something bad happened to them. This is the case for a Mi'kmaq woman from Nova Scotia who was stolen from her family not once but twice. And after having been rejected in her bid for compensation, she chased down proof all the way to the United States. Freelance journalist Trina Roach has her story. I'm back here. I'm speaking for us. We didn't lose. And we're not lost. We're not lost anymore. When the Shubenacadie Residential School in Nova Scotia shut down in 1967, Debbie Paul was the last Mi'kmaq student to leave. This picture was taken and was supposed to be given to my mother to say that she's all right. Debbie is 12 years old in this photo. Her life was about to take an incredible turn. They took me. They took me without permission. Five decades ago, Debbie's fate was decided by a nun at the residential institution. Man, that woman was mean. Strict, very strict. Sister Gilberta, her real name was Eleanor Keller, a nun since the 1940s, listed as disciplinarian of girls. We were singing, you know, one little, two little, three little Indians. Actually, she called us savages, and she should have written one little, two little, three little savages. Sister Gilberta also directed the choir, and Debbie had musical talent. Debbie Paul won high praise for her vocal solo. Noted in the records of the Sisters of Charity. Instead of me going back to the reserve, she thought that I should live with her brother and his wife out in Rockland, Mass, to continue my music. When the Shubenacadie Institution closed, Sister Gilberta snuck the 12-year-old out of the country without telling her family. Debbie was then abandoned with the nun's brother and his wife, John and Mary Wentworth, in Rockland, Massachusetts. What would you call, like, what she did in terms of taking you and putting you on a plane and bringing you to Rockland, how, what do you call it? Theft. Theft. Debbie went from the trauma of residential school to what's known as the 60 Scoop, a practice of removing Indigenous kids from their families and cultures and putting them in foster care or up for adoption. Two years ago, she filed a claim for compensation from Canada. I think I deserve it, to live the end of my life, because I went through hell. Her claim was officially rejected. Debbie appealed. Please send us more information on the length of time and location of your placement. I did that, and I have no proof, none, no records. They have no records. Going to Ronklin, Massachusetts, checking the town records, doing all that, that's my paperwork. Debbie needs proof, and she can't find it in Canada. And she wonders why the onus is on her and not the church or government or 60 Scoop lawyers. So she's chasing a paper trail and memories of a place where she was vulnerable and alone. But she's ready. I feel good. I feel good. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not a kid anymore. You made it. Hi there. Made it anyway. 
welcome to Rockland. To Rockland, there we there go. There it is. Rockland, Massachusetts, 30 minutes outside of Boston. Does it feel strange to be back? It does, it does. First stop, the town library. We've requested a property search for 1968 to find the Wentworths. Go to Myrtle Street. Here they are at 104. John D. Wentworth, 104. There, in black and white, John and Mary Wentworth. An important confirmation of what Debbie has said all along. You have reached your destination on the left. John and Mary Wentworth both died years ago. But Debbie's painful memories are fresh. He said not to say anything, but that's part of my chores. Ironing, cleaning, and letting this man feel me up, I guess you can call it. I was 12 years old. Those were my chores. What does it do five decades later for you to stand here and look at the house? It helps to heal, to face it, not to be scared of it, to face it, to look at it and look at it in the face and says, yeah, I faced it today. The pieces are falling in place, but Debbie still needs documentation to show she was here as a young teen. We head to the Rockland Public School. In 1968, Debbie felt like an outsider, rejected. Today, a much different experience with an administrator keen to help. Oh, good, good, thank you. Who dug through old files in the school vault. Oh my God, I got my school records. Let's see. Finally, proof she was under the guardianship of John Wentworth. For Debbie, this is validation. This proves everything. This little piece of paper. In residential school, and then secretly sent here to Rockland, Debbie felt unwelcome and unloved, except for one place she always felt she mattered. A neighbor, Mrs. Mary Rome. They gave me so much love, love I really needed. Mary had a piano, and it was the only place Debbie could play music. The other place was bad memories, but this little house is a good memory, good house. They lost touch. Debbie, unsure if Mary is even alive. This is what I do every day. CBC tracked her down. Try it? Yep. Hello, Mrs. Rome. Debbie, how wonderful. How you make me make me cry. Me too. I can't, you but you you didn't change much. Oh, Debbie. Mary Rome. Now Mary Shanklin, age 93 and living in St. John, New Brunswick. I just want to reach out and love you and hug you and oh god. I just can't believe it you're there. Mary recalls her kids saying Debbie wasn't allowed to come play. You had to do housework. Yeah, every day housework. And I didn't like that. I didn't either. <laughs> no, I don't think they treated you very good. No, they didn't. Wait till I show you the other thing. Mary hung on to a souvenir Debbie gave her decades ago. <laughs> Debbie's little Indian doll. <laughs> you sent that to me the first Christmas you were gone. Oh my goodness. And I sat with it and cried. Oh. I thank you so much for giving me so much love. We didn't give you enough. We could have given you so much more. It was enough for me. It was enough. OK? That feels good to me. Debbie may never find the answers to some questions. How and why did Sister Gilberta, Eleanor Keller, take a young Mi'kmaq girl with a talent for piano and leave her in another country? but she finds closure. I'm no longer a lost child. I'm sitting there and I'm saying, you know what? My story matters. My life, I matter. That's what I'm taking home. I matter. Now we have freelance journalist Trina Roach joining us from Beaver Bank, Nova Scotia, near Halifax. So Trina, where does Debbie's story stand right now? 
Not long after Debbie returned home, she got a call from the 60 Scoop administrator who told her that her claim had come up for review. And Debbie said, you know, I have proof, I have paperwork, and she uh, mailed that immediately. Uh, but the paperwork isn't a guarantee. The settlement agreement is specific to harm caused by the federal government. And Debbie was taken by a nun with the Sisters of Charity while she was in the care at the residential school of the federal government. So it's kind of this question now of who will be held accountable, and she just doesn't have an answer yet. Mm. Well, it is a remarkable story, one that we'll keep tabs on. Uh, thank you so much, Trina. Thank you. And support is available for anyone affected by the lingering effects of residential schools. You can access a 24-hour crisis line by calling 1-866-925-4419. When we come back, trouble for the British Prime Minister. I think he speaks utter rubbish. Um, no one believes a word he says anymore. Why he may be facing resistance inside his own party. Do you have anything you want to say? Former Silicon Valley superstar Elizabeth Holmes has been convicted on four counts of fraud and conspiracy. Once lauded as the next Steve Jobs, the 37-year-old faced 11 charges in connection to the failed blood testing company Theranos. Prosecutors argued she knowingly lied about her tech firm being able to detect disease with just a few drops of blood. She could face more than 20 years in prison. Former U.S. President Donald Trump and his two eldest children have been subpoenaed by the New York Attorney General in connection to a civil investigation into the family's business practices. It's the latest in a nearly three-year probe into whether the Trump organization manipulated the value of its real estate holdings. Lawyers for the family called the subpoenas unconstitutional and have asked a judge to block them. A sexual abuse lawsuit against Prince Andrew could be in jeopardy after a U.S. court revealed details of a confidential deal between the accuser and Jeffrey Epstein. Virginia Jufri alleges the prince sexually abused her multiple times following an introduction by Epstein. Under the deal, Jufri received half a million dollars and agreed not to sue anyone connected to Epstein. The wording of the agreement will be debated in a New York court tomorrow. Well, despite surging COVID cases, the UK government maintaining its position. No new restrictions in England for now. But as Farah Morali shows us, the Omicron wave is just the latest political hit to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who's losing support both outside his party and within. Nestled along the river, the scenic village of Thames Ditton, a community that has voted Conservative for 115 years. But on the high street, mixed reviews of Tory Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I think he speaks utter rubbish. Um, no one believes a word he says anymore. I think charismatically he is uh, right up there and I think he definitely gets down with the working class. What's so significant about this constituency, the MP is Dominic Robb, the Deputy Prime Minister and one of the leading members of the campaign to get the UK out of the EU. But the feeling here is one of disappointment. What do you mean Brexit's good for us? Look what's happened. If anybody sees what's been going on over the last year, I think they should really open their eyes and think really carefully about what they really think that Tory values are. The last year, a bumpy one for Johnson. The Prime Minister has been caught red-handed. With allegations he attended a Christmas party at 10 Downing Street in 2020, the night before he announced a countrywide lockdown. And the government's top spokesperson resigned after she was caught on camera joking about the party. I will regret those remarks for the rest of my days. And he has suffered a series of setbacks that have called into question his competence, his fairness, but also his honesty. But it's not just support among voters Johnson should be concerned about, says this expert. The eyes to the right. It's support within his own party, who in a historic revolt as Omicron cases surged, voted against his push to tighten COVID measures. Specifically, the way that he's dealing with COVID is causing disquiet on the backbenches. And there are now rumours of, uh, of outright rebellion and perhaps even the suggestions, though I do stress it's far off, of a possible leadership challenge. Even as overflow centres pop up outside hospitals, Johnson still will not introduce new restrictions, a move some say 
could earn him back political support. I think the way forward for the country as a whole is to continue with the path that we're on. The path ahead paved with uncertainty. Less than three weeks ago, what was considered one of the safest Tory seats flipped Liberal Democrat in a by-election, a sign that allegiances and views may already be shifting. Three, two, one. Farah Morelli, CBC News, London. Well, up next, tackling homelessness outside the big cities. We're flying by the seat of our pants out here. The added challenges in rural Canada and the innovative solutions right after the break. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, as many parents react with frustration and confusion to the sudden announcement of school closures in Ontario due to Omicron, what's next for the rest of the country? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. As record-breaking winter weather hits some parts of the country, many people think about those out in the cold. Julia Wong shows us unique solutions in unique places to combat homelessness. The place Jamie Collins lives in now is a far cry from where he was before, living on the streets. It's awesome that they have this. can help a lot of people. This being transitional housing in what used to be a motel in Whitecourt, a town 180 kilometers northwest of Edmonton. We're at about 60% capacity right now. Sheila Watson oversees the housing initiative, which started during the pandemic. There are common areas for clients and services to help them get on their feet. Just to be able to provide that stability so that people can move forward with their lives is encouraging. Homelessness is often perceived as an urban issue, but COVID-19 has brought it to the forefront in rural areas across Canada. It's a five by eight room. Um, it's meant for one individual. An hour south in Edson, residents set up shelter pods for those without a home. The pods have enough room for a mat, charging outlets, and not much else. The pods open at 8 p.m. You press this button here, and it connects you with a volunteer, who then opens the door remotely. This is the first winter for these spaces, but already the need surpasses the number of pods. It's easy to have it remain hidden in rural, in rural Alberta. We don't have the capacity as they do in the uh, larger centres or the volunteer base to assist in those matters. One initiative relies on grants, the other community support. But money will eventually run out because funding from all levels of government is not consistent, leaving rural communities fending for themselves. We're flying by the seat of our pants out here. Collins has lived in the former motel for the last three months. He's already been through detox, plans to enter rehab next, and this. What I would like to do is find my own place. Somewhere he can truly call home. Julia Wong, CBC News, Whitecourt, Alberta. When we come back, after historic flooding prompted a trip to buy new clothes, a BC dairy farmer was inspired to help her community. I got five pair of coveralls, two flannel jackets, a pair of socks and a toque, and it was $700. The initiative that's keeping her neighbours warm this winter. Next. Jimmy Meyer and her family were among many farmers forced to evacuate during the BC floods back in November. After returning home, Jimmy headed out to buy new clothes for her family. The price tag prompted an act of kindness that is still going. Her story is our moment. We all know of the, the flooding in Stumas Prairie in Abbotsford and my family had gotten evacuated. And when we were finally able to come back, it was three days later, and my husband said, we're wet, our clothes are dirty, can you go to Mark's warehouse? I got five pair of coveralls, two flannel jackets, a pair of socks, and a toque, and it was $700. And at that point, I thought, you know, we're just one family. How many other people are out there that are going to be doing this? I thought I would talk to them at Mark's and see if they would allow me to put up a box. If people wanted to donate gift cards, they can put them in that box. And Mark's was willing. They were great. So we started out with helping Sumas Prairie farmers, but it just exploded after that. I started a Facebook page and people were sending us e-transfers. We've handed out about $14,000 in gift cards, probably about $12,000 to be able just to show up and say, hey, we've, we've got this for you. It's very rewarding and very humbling. 
So clearly, uh, one act of kindness has spiraled in and turned into many different acts of kindness. And of course, the nice thing about gift cards, I mean, they have them for a whole big range of businesses that they've been giving out, helping for dozens of families, and the folks can spend them on whatever they like. That's The National for this January 3rd. Have a great night.